everybody. Today we're going to talk about um, one of the very core issues that I get a lot in my practice in regards to interactions with hurt children. And this comes from the school environment and the home and just kind of across the board. And it's this fundamental concept of, um, you know, they're not listening. Um, they're not paying attention. They're not hearing what I have to say. I feel like I have to repeat myself a thousand times. I don't understand. We've just had this conversation. Maybe at school, the teachers uh, don't feel like they can engage with the child. Um, so this is a very common occurrence when it comes to hurt children. And I think in order to tackle this one, we have to kind of get a, just a quick really rudimentary understanding of the brain um, and how that works. Now, I'm not a brain doctor. Um, I like to read about it and I'm, I, I think I try to educate myself quite a bit on it. But in the end, um, understanding a little bit about how the brain works is important in order to understand how to deal um, in this kind of situation. So you'll forgive this very, very like cave art drawing here. But I've kind of basically put 20, 40, 60, 80, 100%. And let's just assume that this piece here is brain processing. Okay, so this is the, the part of the brain that we think about when we think of the brain, right? Which is the part that tells us not to steal, the part that kind of rationalizes, the part that gives us the ability to have this conversation and hear what the other person has to say. So this is basically on a continuum, okay? Now... In many cases, you're not really giving 100% of your brain capacity to much of anything. But the closest I can get to for this is in the morning, right, when you first wake up. In the mornings when we first wake up, or if we are, if those of you who maybe meditate or really practice mindfulness, your brain is free to kind of just have these, this, this influx of thought and this influx of idea. And that's a great time. You know, a lot of people will say, uh, this is the time when they have some of their best ideas, They'll have, for, especially for creative people. And this can happen too when you're kind of like, you know, that driving hypnosis thing that happens where you're kind of zoned out and your your brain is not worried about processing the things that are around you. So it can spend a whole bunch of time up here in this cognitive part of the brain doing all kinds of fun things and, and breaking down puzzles and understanding challenges and just kind of just genuflecting around the, about the world. Okay, so that happens around here in this area here, okay? And again, I, I, would, I would say that there's no time when you're going to be 100% there. But for all intent and purpose, you understand what I'm saying. This area here is usually where we get when our brain is really relaxed and there's nothing competing with its, necess you know, its, its ability to kind of just think about things. This area here is really where we spend most of our day, right? So even you guys here on the, I don't know, maybe, maybe not you guys here, but you know, if you're at work or if you're doing something that requires a, an amount of effort to think about your situation around you, you know, you're in this middle zone, right? So what we're talking about here, for all intent and purpose, you can think on a best case scenario, you're you're processing about 60% of what I'm saying to you. So like while we're having this conversation, something a noise might happen over here and your brain starts to kind of see what's what's going on over here or the cat or the dog or some bird may hit the window or something's happening or your brain kind of has other things to attend to. It could also be the temperature in the room, or you could be thirsty at that time, or your brain might decide, oh, I need to go, I have to remember that I'm hungry. So let's focus a little bit on the hunger. It, it, whatever it is, in, in a lot of situations, in kind of the average situation, we're here, right? When we're learning something and we're hearing things, we're here. And so around 60%, um, you're not, focused 100% on it, but you can take in a lot of the information that exists. And the reason that your brain can do that, the reason that it can focus on what I'm saying right now is because the things around you aren't taking, you know, all of its energy to focus on. But hurt children don't get that luxury, right? They kind of tend to live down here. And, and let me, let me go a little bit into, into that. When you're facing a fear of any kind, your brain wants to focus on that fear. Of course, that makes sense. If you um, have ever been driving, for instance, and totally zoning out, right? But then somebody cuts you off in traffic. All of the your all of this sudden, your attention is completely focused on what just happened and making sure that you auto correct. You might your body might result in some sort of sweat situation. 
you become hyper aware of the situation at hand. You are no longer kind of allowed to pontificate. Whatever thoughts you had over here in La La Land are no longer available to you. Where your brain wants to focus is right now in this situation in the sphere at hand. Um, and I and and if the car example falls on falls for you, then um, even those in a situation where it's not physical, right? So emotional. Um, if you've ever uh, worried that your partner is being, um, you know, is, is stepping out on you or doing some sort of weird something over here on the side, if you've ever gone to like you've ever been out with your friends or your family and you're worried about it and you're checking texts or you're a little thinking about it, you're focused here on this threat. And even though the threat's not a physical threat, your your emotional well-being is threatened. Um, your sense of safety for all intent and purpose in regards to your life as you understand it is threatened and you find it hard to focus on the other thing. And it doesn't matter if somebody tells you, hey, you're fine. No, you don't have to worry about him. It's okay. Even when if you're out in the woods and you see what you think is a snake and you have that initial knee-jerk reaction, you know, that's a knee-jerk reaction. And then, of course, the cognitive part of your brain, the front part of your brain, the one that's usually working when we're when we're over here, tells you, oh, no, that's not a snake. That's just a... It's just a, a twig that looks like a snake, right? That takes a minute to, to tell you that it's not a snake, but your body is still having the reaction, right? So it's the same thing as your friend telling you everything's fine. And, and my point in those is, in, in those situations, you understand what it's like to have your focus taken away from what you wanted to concentrate on, whether it be a sense of peace, whether it be a particular skill like driving or doing some task, you know what it's like fundamentally, everybody knows what it's like fundamentally to have our brain decide, hello, we have to focus over here. Well, hurt children, they are hurt because they have a sense of, un of not being safe. Now, and it doesn't just matter whether or not they were physically unsafe, if they were emotionally unsafe or neglected, there's all kinds of unsafe is like I said, this emotional well-being of having like maybe that you worry about your partner or you're worried about a friend or whatever that situation is, it's not always physical. So when their brains are focused all the time on this concept of safety, before they landed in your care or in your classroom or in your whatever for the day, their brain is spending a whole lot of time elsewhere. And so their ability to focus on what you have to say is in this 20 to 40 percent. This is why you have to repeat yourself multiple times. This is why you may have to say things again and again and again. And it's frustrating as somebody who is caring for a hurt child, but you, it's important to recognize that they're not being, um, they're not purposefully ignoring you or not heeding what you have to say. And I think that mental game that you have to switch and say hey they're not they're not intentionally necessarily being dismissive of the things that I'm trying to teach them or the try the how I'm trying to guide them or even the rules of our home or whatever it is that you're going through it is important to understand that that's not because necessarily that they can't that they don't want to it's that they can't you know what I mean can you imagine what it would be like if when you uh, almost get in an accident, somebody tries to teach you an algebra problem at the time. You know what I mean? And so we think, and what we're, where we get hung up is, we think, well, because we know it's safe, that the child somehow should know it's safe as well. But that is not a true statement. The, the child has to feel that it's safe. And how does a child feel that it's safe? By repetitive and consistent shows that the, that the environment that they are in is safe. And the thing is, is you have no idea what causes them to feel unsafe, right? If they were um, abused, for instance, before they came into your home or they came into your classroom and the abuser was a tall man, um, and I'm not picking on men, but just this is let's throw out an example. If it was like a tall man, 5'11 with brown hair, and the teacher walks in the room and it's 5'11 and, you know, brown hair, you know, when you're in those fear situations, you don't have control over whether or not your brain thinks it's a snake or not. Your brain thinks it's a snake immediately, and then the cognitive portion is the one that says, oh, no, it's a twig, right? We experience this. This is what our children experience on a such on, on such a bigger scale that it's almost, it, it makes it sometimes for the, some of these kids really impossible to focus. And if we're lucky, if we're lucky, the children in our care end up here in this 40%, but a lot of them come in here in this 20% because the 
the environment that they lived in was so erratic that it was so uncertain. They may have had safety one day, but then unsafe the next day. It's so haphazard and chaotic that they haven't had time to really get a sense of the safety in your environment. And I wanna be clear about this, that safety is not always just physical, right? You may think, well, I, this is a, you know, that we're an upstanding citizens in this world and we're wonderful people. And how do the kids not know that, right? Like my home is this grand, lovely area of wonderfulness, but your child doesn't necessarily know that. They have to feel that. And the only way you feel safe is consistently going through an environment every day, all day and feeling that sense of safety until your brain finally says, okay, I'm okay. Right? Imagine being dropped into just right now, someone picked you up, dragged you out of your house or your work or wherever it is that you're listening to this and took you to a place where you've never been before and dropped you in that environment. And it's a completely sketchy environment, right? Maybe it looks like there's crime there. Maybe it looks like there's um, people watching you, whatever that situation is. How long do you have to live in that environment before you feel like you're safe? Now, if you're a healthy individual, you'll try to do a lot of the cognitive processing that I've been talking about that you can do when you're here. But if you haven't yet got, if you're, if you're still already worried about all the other things, if you've been dragged into another situation before, if you've been, you know, this is not the first time you've been dropped in these environments and sometimes the environments are safe and sometimes they're not. You know, you're not dealing with the ability all the time to immediately cognitively reset and figure out what's going on. So we have to have a lot of grace with these children. We have to have a lot of time and, 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 and calmness with these children. And I know that I'm trying to keep these short so that they're digestible pieces, but I want to bring one more thing up in regards to safety. Now, we'll talk in later episodes about how you kind of introduce this concept of safety in your home um, or in your environment or whatever. There's a lot of, of ways and tools that we can use in which to kind of try to bring home that idea of safety to our children. But many years back, I was at a conference and this guy came up and I think it was from Arizona and he had mentioned some study that he had done where for all intent and purpose, 80% um, of the children that were in care had been sexually abused at some point, even if that statistic, even if those people weren't in care for being sexually abused. Do you see what I'm saying? So like, I, I don't know the statistic and I'm going to get it wrong, but let's just say, let's just for a the sake of argument, say that 25% of kids that are in care now, displaced from their homes, have been are in care because there was a, uh, a, a reliable instance of sexual abuse to that child. That's like 25%. There are now 60-ish percent of kids that are in care for neglect, for physical abuse, for whatever reason. And they also have been sexual abused. And many times the families and the, even the social workers or even the people around them don't know these kind of hidden things about these kids. So we think we're always dealing with whatever's on the paper or whatever has been presented to us. But a lot of the times the hurt is so, so far into these kids and there's so much more underneath the, just the surface of the dirt that we don't understand that gives them this feeling of non-safety no matter how, ma how many times we try to make their environment as safe as possible, right? So I say that to say that, you know, there are certain things that we need to do in addition to just what we would imagine to be safe protocol to ensure that the kids at their, even the layers we don't know about are feeling safe. And again, there's a couple, we'll go into some of that in some um, later episodes. Um, I'll give you one now, just for those people that are, are that have foster and adoptive children in your homes and they are hurt children. One of the very best things that you could do is set up an alarm system at a room level, right? A lot of these kids that have been sexually abused, if they were sexually abused by, um, if not a family member, again, not being in care, not being, having been in care because of that, they may have been sexually abused by a foster family. They may have been sexually abused by other children in a foster home of some kind. So when you can put, they have these alarm systems that they have at like Walmart or Target or whatever, and you can put them over the doors of individual rooms that kind of basically create this alarm door that occurs. And if you can, you know, just that act, just that one act alone of ensuring that a child knows and, and feels like, hey, when I'm sleeping, which is one of the most vulnerable times in a kid's life, which is why so many of our kids, so many hurt children have trouble sleeping, 
you know, sleep equals vulnerability. I'm hurt. I feel unsafe. I don't want to sleep, right? That's, of course, it makes sense. Um, adding that layer of safety for the nighttime can do a whole lot for these children's sense of safety in the home while they're there. Um, so I want to give that tip to you because I think that kind of should be a, that should be like a thing all over the place. I think the first I heard about that, the alarms over the doors, somebody had reported that, um, you know, the incidence of, of sleep deprivation in kids in care like reduced dramatically. And I think it's definitely, I mean, it just, it just, it just makes sense, right? It totally makes sense. Even if those statistics were a little off or that was just for that county or whatever the situation was, it, there's no denying that a lot of kids in our care have complicated hurt that may not be what is written on the paper as to why they came into care. And so we need to account for that. We need to be thinking about that. And if your child is at all fearful of um, being vulnerable, which I'll tell you right now, they are, then um, giving them an environment where they can feel safe when they sleep can do a great deal of goodness to them and their sense of um, happiness and well-being. So go forward, go forth, forward with that. And um, in subsequent, like I said, later episodes, we'll talk a little bit more about the safety. We'll revisit this again. Being safe is like the top notch, it's the number one, you know, thing to, to kind of just sit with and always have in the back of your head when it comes to safety. It helps deal with tantrums. It helps deal just that, that fundamental idea that safety is an issue uh, can help us tackle a lot of things um, with our children. So I hope that this has helped you. Um, and again, as always, if you think of something that you would really like me to talk about, please feel free to send me an email or write it in the um, anywhere, Facebook, wherever, social media, and uh, I'll get to it. And thank you very much and have a great day.